I've been in the mood to read something that truly scares me. That's pretty rare. I'm not a person who scares easily. It's possible that some modern writers are told to dial it back when they write scary books, because who knows, a kid could be reading them. I don't know, but I do know that I've been feeling the lack of genuine scares lately, so I went to my local used bookstore and browsed the shelves in their horror section. I like used bookstores because they usually have much larger horror sections than a chain store might, and they definitely have a lot of older stuff there. Stuff you will never see on bookshelves in modern bookstores anywhere ever again. I happened upon this book almost by mistake. It was one of the last ones on the shelf, and it was shoved behind some others, almost like the store wanted to hide it. One look at it and I knew it was old, quite possibly a first edition. The book was clearly first published long ago, and this one had been well loved. Its pages were yellowed, dog-eared all over the place. The cover was peeling up and near to falling off. Actually, the cover was what caused me to pick it up. There was a precious little description on it. Other than its title and the author's name, the front contained no information, and on the book cover there was simply a Yates quote. The darkness drops again, but now I know that twenty centuries of stony sleep were vexed to nightmare by a rocking cradle, and what rough beast its hours come round at last, slouches towards Bethlehem to be born. That poem always gives me the shivers, and I was impressed by the decision to put it on the back. The first page had an excerpt, and it seemed to be about a farmer and his haunted scarecrow. That really didn't sound too horrifying, but if the cover made me pick it up, the quote is what made me take it to the cashier. At worst, I would have wasted five bucks. At best, I might have a genuine undiscovered classic on my hands. The cover of the book made it feel both ancient and timeless. It was very simplistic, but it evoked something in me some primal feeling that I found impossible to ignore. I might be making too much out of it, but I got a sense of foreboding looking at that cover. Modern novels tend to go all out and create an image of a monster that might be found in a special effects laden big budget horror schlock fest designed to do little more than get teenagers in the seats. This cover was far more minimalist but conveyed more of a sense of unease in me than a million killer scarecrow movies ever could. So I picked it up and I brought it home. I'm only a few pages in, but already starting to feel like I've made a mistake. I've never heard of R. Scabry before, but from the first few pages he doesn't strike me as much of a writer. He goes pretty light on the scares, and when he does try and scare you, he uses a torrent of cliches that I doubt would scare a five-year-old. I'm being a little more forgiving, though, because the book isn't very long, and it's not unlikely that these cliches weren't cliches at all when Scabry was writing them. Hell, he might have intended some of them. The story, believe it or not, spends surprisingly little time out on the farm or anywhere near the titular scarecrow. It's actually strangely political. Mostly about this 50-ish farmer named Fenton McCall and his tireless efforts to throw the local farmers union rep out of the town, because he doesn't feel that they'll be fair to the workers. At least that's mainly what it's about in the first three chapters. The only time the scarecrow itself makes an appearance is at the end of chapter one wherein McCall has just finished setting it up, and thinks to himself that it's a mighty fine scarecrow. That's literally all the scarecrow action we've gotten thus far. There was one scene that was slightly unsettling, wherein McCall, who has been depicted as a stern but loving husband, snaps at his wife when she asks about the assembly meeting he's just come home from. Just that one part, that's all that's gotten under my skin, and even then it was less about the out-of-character behavior 
and more just a sense that scene gave me that not all is well. Update. As it turns out, I was right about the scene being meant as unsettling. It's becoming clear as I read that Fenton McCall is slowly losing his mind. That's kind of more like a horror story, but still not particularly frightening. What does it have to do with the scarecrow, you ask? Well, as McCall's madness grows, he begins to imagine the scarecrow talking to him and following him as he does his work on the farm. It whispers horrific ideas, or at least ideas that Scabri clearly hopes you'll find horrific, in his mind about murdering his nagging wife and burning down the town assembly hall at the next meeting. However, there was one thing I wasn't prepared for. The book is illustrated. I'm not kidding. I don't know how I missed that when I flipped through the book at the store, but there it is. The art is something special, not at all in tune with the rather boring book. I flipped to the incredibly sparse credits page and could not find mention of an artist, except the one for the cover image, and he clearly isn't the guy who made the illustrations on the inside. His style is very vivid, even if it's also simplistic. His drawings look almost like photographs, except blurry, or with eyes shown as glowing holes. I've scanned in the first image, which I trust you will agree is rather strange looking. That's literally supposed to be McCall and his wife. Yeah, I don't get it either. There's nothing scary about this scene in the book. They're just walking home from church and discussing the union leader. But this is how our illustrator chooses to convey that scene. If the book itself were one-tenth as frightening as that picture, I'd probably give it a much more favorable review than I have so far. I know that some of you might think the image is cheesy looking. Okay, I'll grant you that even looking at it here on my computer, it looks way less intense. But there's something about looking at it from the page itself that I can't even begin to describe. A feeling like they're looking at me. Maybe I just stayed up too late reading. Update. Taking a break from reading this damn book today. It's starting to get to me. Not Scabbery's writing. It still sucks. But just the... I can't really explain it. There's more pictures in the book than I realized. I'm not going to upload any more of them for now because I'm having a hard time bringing myself to look at them. It's not so much what's in them as what feels like is there behind them. Whatever it is, I don't like it. I'll say this. The story has taken a strange turn. It's still barely talked about. But Scabri at one point has the Scarecrow, while talking to McCall, make mention of they, as if he has someone he's reporting to behind the scenes. I don't want to dig out that passage right now, because when I read it, it gave me a chill. There was a picture on the next page, and somehow I knew that they, whoever they are, were in the picture. It only showed two young girls, but I could sense them in the picture just the same. That's enough of that. I sound paranoid or something. It's really not as bad as I'm making it sound. Not really. I decided to Google our Scabbery today, see if there's anything else he's written. Literally only three hits came up. I'm pretty sure I would get more hits if I googled my own name. The first hit was a used book site that had once been selling Scarecrow, but it was out of stock and the site looked like it hadn't been updated in years. The second hit was a dead link, which was too bad because it looked like it might contain the most actual info about the book. Maybe it would even tell me who did the artwork within the book. The final hit was a pure black page 
and the weight circle kept spinning in the center as if it were loading a video or something. I waited for nearly 10 minutes and while no video loaded, I could swear I heard whispers coming out of my speakers. They were low and I could never make out what they were saying, but I could hear them even as the circle kept spinning. Now here's where things get weird. I went back to the search page later on because I was going to try and let that page sit there as long as it took to load, but the hit wasn't there anymore. The first two useless links still were, but not the last one, which was the only one that I seemed to get any kind of result from, even one so unsatisfactory as a blank page attempting to load a video. So instead, I googled the name of the publishing house that printed the book. Margrave Press. I got tons of hits, but when I put the name in quotes, only two pages of hits loaded, and only one hit seemed to have anything to do with a publishing company. It makes a brief mention of a guy named Tom Harkey, who worked as a copy editor at Margrave Press for a short while in the 60s, before leaving for Bantam when Margrave went under. I googled Tom Harkey, who has his own page with contact info, and so I sent him a short email. It went like this. Dear Mr. Harkey, I recently picked up an older, used book that was published by a now defunct publishing house that you worked at until it closed. Do you remember much about your time at Margrave Press? If you do, I hope you can give me some information about a writer named R. Scabbery who wrote the book I'm reading. It's a horror novel called Scarecrow. Specifically, I'd like to know who it was who contributed the in-book artwork for the book, as it's very well done. But I can't seem to find the name of the artist, and online info doesn't seem to help either. Any help you can offer on this would be greatly appreciated. I also decided to Google Wesley Childs, the artist who did the work for the front cover. He also has a website, but nowhere on it did I see the simple yet evocative picture he had done for Scarecrow. In fact, nothing he had up on his website looked much like that. We'll see if I ever hear back from either of them. Update. Well, I am almost halfway through the book now. I decided to keep reading despite any misgivings I felt the other day. Scabry's skills with prose and dialogue haven't improved, but the story has taken a much darker turn. I guess I understand a little better why Yates the Second Coming was used as a quote now. As McCall's madness grows, the more he starts speaking in poetic gloom and doom language, like the poem. He even quotes it a few times. At one point, he screams at the man leading the town assembly meeting that the best lack all conviction while the worst are full of passionate intensity. He turns murderous later and finally kills a fellow farmer, one that was the most outspoken that the union should be formed. And just before slitting his throat, hisses at him that things fall apart, the center cannot hold. My first reaction to this usage of the poem is to say bullshit. Because honestly, it's like Scabry just liked the poem and thought it sounded scary. So he decided his murderous farmer would start spouting passages of it. There's no clue elsewhere that he's the kind of man who would even read Yeats. However, there is an apocalyptic tone to the poem and the Scarecrow has an apocalyptic tone when he speaks to McCall. He warns him that the tide is turning and soon all innocence will be drowned, which also comes from the second coming. Somehow Scabry's able to make the line sound like the Scarecrow came up with them. Maybe he's not as bad a writer as I thought. Also, those pictures keep appearing. I swear earlier today I flipped ahead five or six pages to see when this chapter would be over, and there weren't any pictures. Just now I flipped to the third page, and I was greeted by this. I mean, 
What the hell is that? It has nothing, literally nothing to do with the story. And I could swear it wasn't there earlier today. Much like the others, those eyes, man. I want it to be just my imagination, but I swear they're looking at me and seeing me. Writing it down like that, it feels stupid. But all I can say is read this damn thing for yourself and tell me it doesn't creep you out. Update. Heard back from Wesley Childs today. He says he only barely remembers making that drawing. The dude is something like 80 now, and he was commissioned for that piece in the early 60s. He said he's never read the book himself, and that he only remembers the painting when I emailed him. He seems surprised that anyone is reading this book in the modern age, because according to him, they only printed a handful of copies. He wasn't sure how many. He was not aware that anyone was hired to do in-book artwork, or even that there was any. That inspired me to try and get a hold of Tom Harkey again. I decided it had been long enough that I should have at least gotten a formal response. So I sent a quick email to him asking if he'd had time to consider my request. Almost immediately, and I mean like five minutes after I hit send, I received this from what I guess is one of his staffers. Do not attempt to contact us again. We are blocking your email and your IP address. Farther attempts at contact will be considered harassment and will be dealt with by the proper authorities. Whoa, I wasn't expecting that. I mean, I waited a week between emails and I was pretty polite both times. I'm trying not to read too much into that. I went back to the book today, still not sure if I had the constitution to keep reading it. I don't want to see those pictures again. I don't want to feel them looking at me. The Scarecrow is not actually speaking to McCall, but it's clear that something is. Every time there's a mention of them, the next page has a photo of those strange silhouetted people. And I have to believe it's just the way the artist had with his work that makes me sure that something is watching me from behind those pictures. Update. Okay, I'm sorry for the tone my reviews I go read has taken. I am trying very hard not to let my concerns show in my posts, but it's slipping through. I haven't had the strength to pick up the book since the last time I wrote. I got worse after receiving a second email from Wesley Childs. He apologized for lying to me and told me that the reason he didn't remember the Scarecrow painting is that he had purposely tried to forget it. According to him, as he was painting it, he kept hearing whispering, and once it was completed, he could swear it was coming to life and talking to him through his dreams. He mailed it as soon as he could and spent days after that trying to get rid of the feeling of being watched or believing that he heard whispers. He says he's never made a painting like that before and never has been able to again. It was the first and last work he did for Margrave Press. He also told me that he met R. Scabry, but only once and that it was just a pen name. Unfortunately, he doesn't remember what the man's real name was. He said Scabry was a small man who seemed nervous all the time. I wrote back and asked him why he thinks Tom Harkey would wish to block me and threaten me with the authorities just for asking about this book. He replied just a few minutes ago to tell me that Harkey has been asked a couple of times before during Q&A sessions about his time at Margrave, and any time he is asked, he immediately concludes the session and walks out. He won't talk to anyone about Margrave. Childs himself once tried to reach any other contacts that commissioned him for the cover art, but he found none. It's as if Margrave Press never existed, other than its tenuous connection to one man. Update. 
It's been another week. Woke up this morning to an email from Tom Harkey in my inbox. It wasn't the website address. It looked more like an account for personal use. It said only this. If you have that goddamn book in your house, burn it. I haven't burnt it. It's on my coffee table right now. I can barely bring myself to look at it. Whatever is seeing me through the book can now see me even when it's closed. I have a feeling it's the rough beast moving its slow thighs, slouching towards Bethlehem. Maybe that beast inspired the great poet William Butler Yeats to write about it and just over 40 years later inspired a hack writer who called himself R. Scabry to do the same. I don't know. I don't care anymore. I just wanted to stop talking to me. Update. I tried to burn it. I did. I used kitchen tongs and took it out to my backyard. I dropped it in an old steel bucket and struck a match. Then I held it there. I waited. I couldn't drop the match. Something was going to make sure that if I burned the book, I would feel every flame the book did tenfold. I put the match out and left the book in the bucket. I'm not going back for it. Update. I've nearly finished the book. There have been no pictures for the last several pages. There don't need to be any. They tell me what has already been happening. They tell me what is going to happen. They see me through the words I read.